is prepared, it's sanctified, and then the Lord plants a garden eastward in Eden. Now, you folks are farmers and have to know how you plant a garden. You get yourself some seeds, don't you? And then you dig a little hole and put a fish in it. <laughs> I don't know about that fish in this instance. But you get the fertilizer there, and you get the thing growing. All right, so they planted a garden. Where did they get the, where did they get the seeds? Interesting, W. Fabry Phelps said they got it from Kolob. And that's an interesting idea. I don't know that he has any right to say that, but maybe he was in on the know on a few things. And then when it comes to, to the formation of man, when it comes to the formation of man, uh, then the key point of an idea that has been taught and that should be taught, I think, uh, is that uh, it's done through the procreative process. Life on earth, so far as man is concerned, uh, is a part of the eternal family of God. For example, in Moses chapter 6, and this is the genealogy of the sons of Adam, who was the son of God. And he leaves it at that. I think that's where you need to leave it. However, big an island of knowledge may be, there's always a short line of investigation. There's always other questions that need to be asked. And for us, there's, there's a kind of a, an end to that one. Uh, let me put it this way. We are children of our Father in heaven in spirit life. And if you could trace the genealogy of your physical body back, you would go back to the man of holiness. He is your progenitor. You see that? He is your progenitor. Now, the details of that, that's another ball game. But he is your progenitor. You are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, sinew of his sinew. You see that? And that is the general picture. See? And so when it comes to the place of life on earth, you take uh, eternal elements, you get them uh, organized, you take fragments of other worlds, and I don't know where those other worlds come from, and I really don't have anything on it that's, uh, uh, I would anywhere near call official. I've got an interesting feeling, and that is that this is the redemptive earth. And what would be more appropriate than to take fragments of all those other worlds that uh, have been organized and make the redemptive earth from them. Now, uh, I can support that in a swanswise manner. For example, in uh, uh, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, where he, where he talks about the redemption of the animal kingdom, he's talking about the book of Revelation and uh, about the four beasts of the book of Revelation. Uh, he's talking about John's vision, and John sees a vision of eternity. He says, uh, uh, he says, I suppose John saw beings there in his vision of heaven of a thousand forms that were, that had been saved from ten thousand times ten thousands earths. <laughs> I like that one. Then he goes on and says, strange beasts of which we have no conception, all might be seen in heaven. The grand secret was to show John that there was what there was in heaven. John learned that God glorifies himself by saving all that his hands have made. Whether beasts, fowls, fishes, or men, he will glorify himself with them. And then he talks about those four beasts who are individual animals, but figurative in that they represent the whole animal kingdom. And he says this, the four beasts were four of the most noble animals that had filled the measure of their creation and had been saved from other worlds because they were perfect. They were like angels in their sphere. Now ask yourself the question, what business have those four beasts got to do with the cleansing of this earth and the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of this earth and ushering in the millennial kingdom? They don't belong to this earth. They don't belong to this earth. And yet Joseph says they were four beasts, the noble animals, were filled the measure of the creation, and had been saved from other worlds. Now, why would they have a representation here? 
Because God is a great ecologist. He's red in the face angry with what we're doing with our, with our world, believe me. He is. Believe me, he is. He's interested in plant and animal life. He's interested in their redemption. And this being the redemptive earth, as you read those four beasts about them in the book of Revelation, they don't have anything to do authoritatively in the whole drama that John portrays in his revelation on, on Patmos. They don't have anything to do authoritatively. But they're there, and they're looking, and they're saying, hey, come and see you. Look at this, fellas. <laughs> they're doing that, see? And they're a part of it. And why are they a part of it? Because they represent the animal kingdom of this eternity. And the redemption of this earth is the redemption of the animal kingdom of this eternity as well as of the human family of this eternity. You see that? Now, if the Lord does that for the animals and gives them part in the redemptive program of this earth, and the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of the earth, then isn't it kind of consistent that he might make the earth itself out of fragments of those other worlds? Now, that's my line of reasoning. I'll just leave it with you at that point. You see that? But uh, it's a beautiful picture, to say the least, that the Lord has given us in the, in the Pearl of Great Price. And it finally all ends up then with the earth in its paradisical state. And uh, that paradisical state then is where there's no veil. Uh, let me see if I can find a, a book here from the lectures on faith. I want to read a statement from lecture number two where the uh, prophet Joseph Smith talks about uh, what happens. It's on page 15, if I remember you correctly. He says, After man was created, he was not left to without intelligence or understanding to wander in darkness and spend an existence in ignorance and doubt. As to the real fact by whom he was created, unto whom he was amenable for his conduct, God conversed with him face to face. In his presence he was permitted to stand, and from his own mouth he was permitted to receive instructions. He heard his voice, walked before him, and gazed upon his glory, and note this, while intelligence burst upon his understanding and enabled him to give names to the vast assemblage of his Maker's works. Let me give you a case in point. Over here in the book of Helaman, chapter 4 and 5, you have the account of two Nephite missionaries, Lehi and Nephi, named after the original personalities. And in the course of their ministry, they get thrown into a prison, and the Lamanites are about to come to kill them, but they generate a little faith in the meantime. And they get the endowment of glory and power and fire. And it says this in uh, Helaman chapter 5, verse 44, Nephi and Lehi were in the midst of, of these Lamanites. Yea, they were encircled about. Yea, they were as if in the midst of flaming fire. Yet it did not harm them, nor did it take hold upon the walls of the prison. And they were filled with that joy and with that which is unspeakable and full of glory. And behold, the Holy Spirit of God had come down from heaven and entered into their hearts, and they were filled as if with fire. And note this, and they could speak forth marvelous words. See, they had an endowment. It's like Pentecost. They had a Pentecostal endowment. The point I want to make is that Adam lived in a state of Pentecostal endowment before the fall. Intelligence burst upon his understanding and enabled him to give names intelligently and logically to, to all of his creation, all the Creator's works. Now, we've been at work trying to classify and name the species of the earth ever since the, the rise of Western society in modern times with the Renaissance. We've been doing that. And we're still at it. And the point I want to make is that Adam did it in an easy afternoon. Why? Because he had an endowment of intelligence and power. Do you see that? He was alive spiritually. A person who hasn't been born again, who hasn't got his life centered in Christ so that he's living in the flow of the Spirit, is at best a half a man, more appropriately less than that. He is not complete. You're not a whole person. 
You haven't been made whole, as the Lord, for example, said he did with Enos in the Book of Mormon, see? You're not a whole person. You're walking with one leg instead of two, or trying to. It's only when a person becomes not only physical and intellectual, but when he gets the revelations of the Spirit in his life and begins to live by them. And the flow of the Spirit is there, and the peace and the strength and the manhood and the dignity of the Spirit is there. Then you're a whole person. Now, Adam died when he lost all of that. He died. He lost life. He became less than a half a man. He became a natural man. And uh, under that power then, then he learned the things that he needed to learn. For it's necessary to have an opposition in all things, see. But he fell from that, and this, and he instituted the fall. And uh, with that, let me pick up the story then, on the subject of the fall. And uh, let's get to some of the basic points. We've got what? Five o'clock? Great. We just about got an hour. Now, when we talk about the fallen state and the, and, in the, and the scene before the, before the fall, uh, and the whole uh, scenario of the fall, when we talk about that, we're talking about the land that we now call America. That's what we're talking. For example, here's President Brigham Young. <clears throat> He said of Christ's coming, when he comes again, he will not appear first at Jerusalem, but he will appear first on the land where he commenced his work in the beginning and planted the Garden of Eden, and that was done in the land of America. Okay? Now, the prophet Joseph Smith, by vision, saw a lot of things in relation to this. He saw a whole bunch of things, and uh, he talked rather familiarly about it. It is in America that the saints must overcome the fall until Mount Zion is established, and the glory of God is endowed upon the saints, and then extended to Jerusalem, and then in Christ coming in glory to the whole earth, see. It's here that you've got to begin again. And uh, in the Doctrine of Covenants, you have several references then made uh, to this physical setting. Section 116 of the Doctrine and Covenants is a revelation, for example, that deals with Adam on Diamond. And he just simply says, for example, Adam on Diamond, because, said he, it is the place where Adam uh, shall come to visit his people or the ancient of days shall sit, as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, he doesn't say anything further about that. Let me read you a few statements from some of the other. Here's George Q. Cannon, stated that known as Jackson County. Benjamin F. Johnson, perhaps when that Adam was driven from the place of the tree of life. Oh, well, that's what he calls it. Uh, Reed Peck was uh, one of the authorities of the church in Missouri. Unfortunately, didn't meet the challenge, fell away, but wrote an interesting manuscript in, of, of life in Missouri when the saints were there in Jackson County, and uh, also reported some things that he heard from Joseph the prophet when the prophet uh, uh, was there in Missouri. According to him, Joseph Smith taught that Adam and I, Amen, was the place to which Adam fled after being driven out of the garden in Jackson County. Far west was the spot where Cain killed Abel. And it's interesting in that light to read this statement from section 117, verse uh, 11, where, uh, uh, or is it, let me see, uh, it's 115, this one is 1 verse 15. Uh, let's read verse 6 and 7. That the gathering of my of together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for the defense and for refuge from the storm and for wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the Lord. Let the city of far west be a holy and consecrated land unto you, and it shall be called holy. 
for the ground upon which thou standest is holy. Now that's an interesting when the light of Reed Puck's statement, you see that, the ground on which you... And uh, here in section 117, verse 11, Let my servant Neil K. Whitney be ashamed of the Nicolaitan band and of all thy secret abominations. And I don't know what was going on there, but they were having some kind of a time. And of all his littleness of soul. Now, fortunately, Whitney repented and, and uh, became something considerably better than this. And come up to the land of Adam on Dion, and be a bishop unto my people, saith the, the Lord. In verse 8, he says this, Is there not room enough on the mountains of Adam on Dion, and on the plains of Ola Shinha, or the land where Adam dwelt, that you should covet that which is but the drop, and neglect the more weighty matters? See? Now, this is where Adam dwelt. And uh, you have then other brethren uh, speaking of it, for example, uh, Orson Pratt, Adam and Dion, Meads the land, there the valley where Adam dwelt. John Coral, uh, the valley of God in which Adam blessed his children. And the whole idea then, as it comes from the prophet, and let me just be brief on it, is that this is where things began. And uh, the Garden of Eden was in Jackson County. Adam on Dion was about 50 miles north or so, in that great valley. And that's where the great council of Adam on Dion was held. And that's where the second one will be held. Abel possibly murdered at far west. There are journal statements indicating that people heard Joseph teach that the ark was built in the Carolinas. And Joseph Young, the older brother of Brigham Young, in an interesting document, Keep in mind that he was one of the first seven cousins of the 70s in this dispensation, uh, chosen and ordained in that calling in, in February of 1835. Later he wrote a book called The History of the 70s, and appended to this book in the back was a little uh, statement he entitles Enoch and His City, in which he records statements that he heard by Joseph Smith concerning Enoch. Uh, and among other things, then he says that Enoch City was built in that area that we now call the Gulf of Mexico. Shame. So you've got that picture, at least that picture and other details then that relate to this, to this land. And we're talking about the scenes that went on here in this land. And uh, this then is sacred land. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the genesis of things, and it's going to be the genesis of the second coming. It's where the saints have got to establish Mount Zion and establish things in glory and in power. And then the Jewish people are brought in later. And then after Christ comes, and we'll talk about this Saturday night, when we talk about the second coming, then after Christ comes to the Jews. And the Jews are brought in and made part of the holy order, and the temple is rebuilt, and they're not only baptized, but they're given the blessings of the gospel and the blessings of the church of the firstborn, those that remain. Then Christ will come in his glory, and uh, the dead will have been resurrected as he stands upon the Mount of Olives. And the righteous then, when he appears in glory, will be caught up to meet him in the cloud, and the earth will be renewed to its paradisiacal state, and the great millennial period will begin to be ushered in as you hold uh, the marriage feast of the Lamb, first at Jerusalem and then in Zion, and this fulfills the statement that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, because when you get to Zion, then you center all the keys of things there, and out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, see, on a renewed earth with glory and with power. Now, we're concerned then about the fall, and we're concerned about the fall not just as an event, but I think President Benson expressed it about as well as any. He says this, the Book of Mormon saints knew that the, that the plan of redemption must start with the account of the fall of Adam. Just as a man does not really desire food until he is hungry. So he does not desire the salvation of Christ until he knows why he needs Christ. No one adequately and properly knows why he needs Christ until he understands and accepts the doctrine of the fall. 
and its effects upon all mankind. And no other book in the world explains that vital doctrine nearly as well as the Book of Mormon. Now, the Pearl of Great Price gives us some interesting details into the picture. You see that? But uh, you've got to know the fall. Otherwise, you don't think there's any reason for redemption. See, we're, we're oriented in our thinking with the, with the intellectual view of Western civilization. We're oriented somehow subtly and sometimes a little more overtly with the idea that back prior to the Renaissance, you had an individual, a, a type of society that the individual didn't mean anything. It's the theme that Eric Fromm begins with in his book Escape from Freedom, where he talks about this, this individualist society and then the awakening that took place and about the great challenge that we face now to escape from all of that, escape from, from freedom. And so he writes a classic book on that particular subject. But uh, we're oriented toward that with that mentality. We, we, we kind of think, hey, look what we've done. So-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did. And we finally got up to this great and glorious atomic age and this computer age, and we've done it all with our own intellectual power. You see that? We've done it all with that, and therefore we are at the top of the heap. We're the greatest. We're the boss of Bunker Hill. You see that? We're, we're there. We've arrived. We're the greatest uh, people in, in all of humanity. And we did it then, by and through the intellectual processes. Now, that whole rationale is a bunch of bunk. For the last 14 years, I've been working almost every day. And I'm talking 5 o'clock in the morning or 5.30 sometimes when I bung out a little too late. I make it I have to wait till 6. But from that point on through till the walls begin to fade in and out on me, I've been going back over my early doctoral work and re-studying and re-analyzing and hoping to finally get out a series of five volumes on the origins of America. I think we need it. And the upshot of the whole thing is that liberty in America did not come from the Greeks. Liberty in America did not come from the Romans. Liberty in America did not come from the humanists. It did not come from the secularists. Liberty was born as a gift of God. It came from Christ. It came from people who sought to return to Christ and live in tune with the Holy Spirit. And liberty was a fruit of the Spirit that they achieved by reason of their faith. And then the third source of liberty are the democratic, theodemocratic, to be more accurate, principles within the New Testament. Now that's where liberty came from. And it's a gift of God. America was born of God, and yet we're trying to get God out of everything. And we're controlled by a handful in the media and in the recreation world and and uh, uh, in power positions who foster and promote that program, contrary to our historical origins and contrary to our sacred tradition, say. Well, I've been working on that, and, uh, and this whole picture then of the Western mentality is, is uh, a bunch of bunk. Now, the story of the fall. The fall was a necessary thing. Turn with me, for example, to the Book of Mormon section, or chapter uh, 2 of 2 Nephi. And let's pick up the picture as Lehi gets it from the brass plates of Laban and uh, <clears throat> see what he has to uh, say about it here. 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse, uh, I think it's verse 22. He says, Now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. Now, what does the word state mean? Sometimes when you, if you can do it on your computer, do it. But if you want to, get Reynolds' concordance of the Book of Mormon, and just look under the word state. 
and see what the word state means in the Book of Mormon. The state of the soul between death and the resurrection. The probationary state. The endless state after the resurrection. The word state means the, a condition or order of things that prevail at a given time. You see that? Now, when he says, for example, they would have remained in the garden with, except for the transgression, and all things, that's not just in the garden, that's all things on the earth. Some people try to just exclude this to the garden, and they get kicked out of the garden, and the, the lone and dreary world is out there all the time. And, uh, and the, the situation where there's no death, that only goes on in the garden for some reason. Now, that's not true. There was no death on earth, period. And the earth was in a paradisical state of glory. And all things would have remained in the same state in which they were created, and they must have remained forever. They would still be that way. You see that? And it goes on to say they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no evil. Now, the whole thing then centers in this idea, as he says in verse 11, 2 Nephi 2, 11, for it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. Otherwise, righteousness could not be brought to pass. Now, that's a mentality, again, that we don't get. We've got uh, the big car and the big home and uh, the fancy lifestyle as our mentality. And if you are truly living the gospel, the Lord will bless you and you will climb the social ladder or the political ladder or the economic ladder and you will be riding high and living in high cotton, if you get the idea. That's generally the mentality. And then something hits us and we think more seriously about the book of Job. And we think more seriously about the life of Christ, and we read more intelligently the life of Joseph Smith, where adversity is fundamental to all that they did, you see. And adversity is necessary in order for righteousness to be brought to pass, otherwise there could be none. Now that's a hard doctrine, that's a hard philosophy, see, but that's part of the ball game. And then we're sent here, as the book of Abraham says, to be proved. I will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things that the Lord their God shall command. And in spite of the use of that word, we say that we're here to be tested. Lord can test us. Bunk. The word testing implies what? It implies an unknown element, an unknown factor. You've got to run it through something to find out what's there or what isn't there, right? That's testing. Now, the Lord knows all things. He's omniscient. He's om he's, he knows all things. He knows and knew before you ever got here the clothes that you were going to wear and where you were going to sit in this meeting. That's how detailed his foreknowledge is. That's exactly how, and I'm telling you the truth, that's how detailed his foreknowledge is. He knows all things. You're not here to be tested. You're here to be proved. Now, proved means that you're here to run you through a series of experiences and bring out what is there, and bring what is there to the surface. Bring it to the surface so that it's actually demonstrated in fact, and so that there is actual reality. The substance then, the substance then is brought forth to be reality. And this then is the proving process. And it's the process then by which righteousness is brought to pass. And it takes opposition in all things to bring to pass righteousness. That proving process, sometimes take the pressure cooker, and you need to be on the inside instead of listening to it whistle on the out. You need to be on the inside. And you wonder then, which is straight up and which is up straight down? And the pressure is there. And you wonder then, why? Why me? And why all this? See? And the reason for that is because the Lord loves you, and he's working on you to bring out what's there. See? And so you're here then to be, to be proved. And uh, in, in the story of the creation, then we see, for example, Mother Eve and Father Adam 
then playing the great role that they played. And the sectarian world, what have they done with that? One minister made the comment that the, that the sin of, a of Cain killing Abel was an act of righteousness in comparison with that of Adam. Uh, now that's how blind and how naive. Now, and we say even as Latter-day Saints, uh, something less than we need to say about Mother Eve. Now it's true that Mother Eve was deceived. The deception program is there. But, got a sounding voice down here, but it's also true that she knew intelligently enough about the order of things that she saw the need for it and permitted herself to do it willingly. That is also necessary to understand, see? And that's inherent in the book of Moses. That's inherent within it. It doesn't come out and say it point blank blunt. But note, for example, after the Lord had revealed then the purpose of the law of sacrifice, as it centered in Christ and the end results of that law. Then in verse 11 of Moses 5, it says, And Eve, his wife, Adam's wife, heard all these things and was glad. Now, now she's vindicated. And it's not just, hey, I told you so, but, but she's joyfully glad now because she's seen the fruits of her action. And she said, Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed. And the mother instinct there comes right out first. And uh, that was part of it, see? We never should have had seed and never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto the obediency. When we say man is that he might have joy, as Lehi does in connection in with the fall, Adam fell that men be, might be and that men are that they might have joy, sometimes we don't really fully comprehend what the word joy means. Joy means having been away from home a long, long time, and having missed the home environment, and then having been brought back to enjoy what you previously had. But in this instance, joy means having been severed from the glory, the power, the love of God that is inherent and made manifest through His Spirit. And having wandered then, seeking to find that something deep within your soul that isn't satisfied, that's there, that void, that, that empty chasm that's there, and then to have that filled with the power of truth and the revelation of the gospel and the witness and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Joy is being dipped into darkness and brought forth back into light. Okay? You see that? Now, when he, she talks about the joy of our redemption, it's the joy of redemption. It isn't just rah, rah, let's join the jet, jet set and let's have a good time in the sky. The joy of redemption, then, is to come back to the Lord and to feel the flow of the Spirit and to feel like a human being again and to know that you're his son and to know that you're his daughter. And to know that he knows that you are, and he knows your name, and he's interested in you, and he's got you in the palm of his hand, and you know that you're there. And despite the challenge of opposition and adversity, you know that he is there, and you know that he undergirds your life. And you can feel that strength and that power and that goodness that comes, see? That's what joy is, see? It's the joy of redemption. And here Mother Eve then goes through this whole scenario of feeling these things, as a great personality, and knowing the need for them, and then knowing also that you've got to yield. And so she kind of beats Adam to the draw and does it. And then she puts him in an interesting position. And when he sees the reality of things, then he faces up to the music and commits the first great act of chivalry. He says, Honey, <laughs> Whether thou goest, I will go. <clears throat> and he fell that men might be. And that's where you distinguish then between those actions as uh, from sin. They weren't sinful actions. They were transgressions. Now, transgression is to break the law. Sin then is 
either willfully or in ignorance to yield your will to the will of the adversary and to act according to his will on the basis of some kind of fantasy and some kind of lust and some kind of self-interest and then go through and break the law. This is sin. You see that? Now, neither Mother Eve nor Adam did that. They transgressed. They didn't sin. Okay? I was over visiting my son one time, and his little children were working uh, out in the yard, and one of them... <coughs> got a little exuberant and broke one of the limbs of his new tree. And the other one went in to tell Daddy. And the third one came in, and as Daddy was getting the story, the third one jumped in and says, Daddy, Daddy, it wasn't a sin, it was a mistake. <laughs> It wasn't a sin. It was a mistake. Well, now, it wasn't a mistake in this case. It was a transgression. You see that? And in that transition, then, you change the whole order of things. To begin with, for example, let me give you a few statements from some of the brethren on, on the fall. Here's Brigham Young. When the Lord... Uh, well, let's go. When the Lord said, let there be light, he says... Uh, there was light brought forth and so forth, and he says, This is the glory of the earth from which it uh, came, and it's the glory to which it's destined uh, to return. Uh, he says, When the earth was framed and brought into the existence, and man was placed upon it, was near the throne of, of our Father in heaven. And when man fell, the earth fell into space and took up its abode in this planetary system, and the sun became its light. Here's an article in the Times and Seasons, the official church magazine, in February of 1842. The earth no longer at the fall retained its standing in the presence of Jehovah, but was hurtled into the immensity of space, and there to remain till it has filled the time of its bondage to sin and Satan. He says, uh, but one uh, says, wherein did the sin of Adam affect the whole creation? We answer that Adam was placed in the garden or capital of the whole earth, and power was given to him to sway his scepter over all things upon the earth. Therefore, when, the, when he fell from the presence of the Lord, the whole of his dominions fell also. And then he goes on to say that the sun should not only redeem them, Adam and Eve, from the fall but should redeem the earth, or in other words, restore it to its original state and standing. Now, that's the great cosmic picture that we call Mormonism. Here's President John Taylor writing to a letter in a paper that he edited called The Mormon, under date of August 29th, 1857, speaking to this woman about her coming to mortality. He says, Thou being willing and anxious to imitate them, others who had come, prayed to thy Father in heaven for the time to arrive when thou couldst come to this earth which had fled and fallen from where it was first organized near the planet Kolob. You see that picture? Now that's the cosmic picture then of the fall. Here's a, a statement by uh, a fellow by the name of Addison Everett. Brother Everett said that he heard Joseph say that the earth had been divided and parts taken away. I better not talk about that one. But the time would come when all would be restored and the earth again would revolve in its original orbit next to Kolob and be second in size to it. See, Well, that's basically the picture, and there's a lot more to that. that uh, but when the fall took place then... It was actually a reorganization of life. It wasn't just Adam being shown the door of the garden. Now you get out. It was a reorganization of life. Adam didn't have blood before. He was a physical, spiritual being. He wasn't, uh, well, he was in an unmortal state, but he didn't have blood in his body. And when he fell, then there's a reorganization. 
within his system. And that's true then. That's true of the whole kingdom of life. For example, here in the third chapter of the book of Moses, as the Lord talks about the, the placement of the, of the plant kingdom upon the earth here, in verse 9, he says, And out of the ground, now this is a physical organization, out of the ground made I of the Lord God to grow every tree naturally that is pleasant to the sight of man, and man to behold it. And it became also a living soul, for it was spiritual in the day that I created it. Now that tree organized out of the ground was a spiritual, physical organism. It was spiritual in the day that I created, for it remaineth in the sphere in which I, God, created it. Yea, even all things which I prepared for the use of man. And man saw that it was good for food. Now, if man could eat the tree, the fruit of the tree that was organized in the earth, but which was a spiritual, physical tree, what kind of a being was man? You see that? He was in the same order of things. And so when you come to the fall then, then you have a, a major change. Here's a statement, for example, by Orson Pratt. First, it was spiritual in its blessings and fullness of life and glory, and then it was reduced to a temporal condition wherein misery and wretchedness existed. Here's a statement from Parley P. Pratt quoted by President John Taylor in his book on the government of God. It says, First man fell from his standing before God by giving heed to temptations. And this fall affected the whole creation as well as man and caused the various changes to take place. He was banished from the presence of his Creator, and the veil was drawn between them, and he was driven from the Garden of Eden to till the earth, which was then cursed for his sake. Here's uh, President Brigham Young. When our first parents fell from their prior disciple state, they were brought into contact with influences and powers of evil that are unnatural, those that prevailed in their former state, that is, and stand in opposition to an endless life, see. How the earth was moved away from its original place of creation, and uh, a whole new order of things, the temporal order, was instituted, and life then was on the temporal plane, and the sun became our light. And the revolutions of the earth in relation to this solar system became the basis of computing our time. And it was a whole different ball game. And that program then existed and uh, we're still a part of it. We're still coping, wrestling with that challenge. Now, what were the effects of the fall? Well, as we've indicated, the earth was removed from Kolob. Secondly, there was a whole change of things. Well, that change of things was a two-stage program, and here the Pearl of Great Price makes a very interesting contribution. I'm reading now from chapter 5 of the book of uh, Moses. Here in chapter 5, you have the account of Adam being instructed to offer sacrifice. He doesn't know why he does it, but he does it nevertheless. And an angel comes and tells him this is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten and the way of redemption for him in the situation that the fall produced. See, he didn't lose his knowledge of the pre-fall of, of the pre state. Joseph Smith makes that clear in the lectures, lectures of Faith number 2. He didn't lose a knowledge of how it had been to be in God's presence any more than Joseph lost the knowledge of what he saw in the sacred grove after he walked home. You see, he didn't lose that knowledge. And he knew then that he was in a different order of things. And uh, so he obeyed the law of sacrifice. And then the angel came to him and said, This is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten, and, and commanded him to do all things in the name of Christ. And uh, then, on this basis, then they thrilled with the joy. Uh, that they felt as a result of that. And they began to talk to their kids, because Adam was, was a grandfather at this point. He had children, and his children had children. And they lived in that state of things without really knowing too much. But and then they had the challenge of the gospel given to them in that context. And uh, it says, Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. And Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God, 
And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not. And they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God. Now, here's the punchline. And men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. Now, when you talk about mortality being a state of carnality and of sensuality and of devilishness and so forth, Adam didn't do it. What did Adam do? He got us out of the presence of God. But it was relatively a clean state. And it's only when people then love Satan more than God and yield to the enticements of the flesh that carnality comes in and this life becomes carnal and sensual and devilish. Now, what I'm saying is that the fall was a two-stage action. Adam and Eve brought it then from here down to this level, relatively innocent but outside of God's presence. And then the rest of us have made major contributions <laughs> from that point on. You see that? And where carnality prevails. And that doesn't, just isn't environment. That kind of thing gets transmitted then through physical means. And uh, disease, problems, uh, these things then are built up. And it takes clean living and so forth to overcome a lot of these. But there's a lot of it that's still in the genes, if I can put it that way, see? And we're under the power of the fall in so many different ways. And a lot of it then, if you were to trace this history, would go back then to some kind of overt... Uh, transgressions and distortions of basic law. You see that? And the world then is in a carnal and sensual state. Now, mortality, meantime, then, is sustained by the power of the atonement. The power of the atonement begins to operate at the very moment that Adam was driven out of the garden. The power of the atonement, as we've read here from uh, the teachings, page 190, where the everlasting covenant was made between three persons, and Christ then stepped in and made the covenant even before it happened, saying, I'll pay the debt. And as the fall got underway then, then the power of the atonement came into action. Now, if the power of the atonement did not begin to act, then Adam's transgression would have brought a total spiritual death. This would include the light that we can get from the sun, if the earth was put into the solar system without the atonement. This would include, then, the light that, we, that every person is born with, the light that's in Christ, that comes from Christ, Christ being the light who lighteth every man that cometh into the world, as John says in John 1. See, that would be, uh, there would be none of that, and you would be totally withdrawn and separated from, and from the quickening powers of God, and life would have ceased to exist on earth, because you can't have organized life without the sustaining power of Jesus Christ. See? So we live and move. In Christ we live and we move and we have our being. And there are certain powers then that are given universally by and through the atonement, and we may get a chance to say a few things on that that are given generally to all people, independent of the righteousness or wickedness of the people. He sustains us. As, as uh, King Benjamin said in, in Mosiah chapter 2, he sustains us moment by moment and gives us breath, you see. And we live in Christ, whether we recognize it or not. We live in him. Now, spiritual death came upon man. There was a withdrawal of God's Spirit. But there was a cushioning action, so that we're suspended, if I can put it this way, between glory and perdition. There's a suspension action by the power of the atonement. And that gives us then the rights of what the scriptures call moral agency. So that even in this suspended action, if you revolt against God, you can still go down further. Or if you apply yourself with righteousness, you can begin to go up, see? And that's the essence then of moral and spiritual agency. And that's the reason the Constitution was written, primarily. It wasn't written as a welfare state program. It wasn't written to coddle us from the womb to the tomb. It was written to give us the agency that we need to exercise our own inventiveness and our own genius, ingenious actions, and to work together as free people. And it's given above all, as the Lord says here in section 101, 
to give us our moral agency. He says, for example, according to the laws and constitution of the people which I have suffered to be established and should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh, not just Americans, all flesh, according to just and holy principles, and the reason for it that every man may act in doctrine and in principles pertaining to futurity, that is, to the future, according to the moral agency which I have given unto him. See? So that you're free and uninhibited from moral choices. That's why the Constitution is here. It's here as a sacred document of liberty. And it's expected then that within that framework, Christian people then ought to work for social justice. They ought to work to uplift each other. And they ought to work then to, to apply the Christian law, to love your neighbor as yourself economically as well as in social matters. And in that way, then, to institute an order of society and its business operations and its economic aspects that opens the door of opportunity for people and that it gives people who have demonstrated merit and ability and opportunity to grow and to develop and to, and to achieve. And all of this, then, as a stewardship as a stewardship, not as something to get you in the jet set class, but as a stewardship, then uh, handling God's produce and his, in his, in his earth and its blessings and bounteous things in order then to promote peace and unity and prosperity. See, the Christian ethic needs to be there. Well, as we uh, uh, spirit death then came in, and uh, also then physical death. And the Pearl Price then makes this contribution that physical death in some measure is a, a consequence, it's a consequence of spiritual death. Now there's qualifications to that, and so don't take it all the way, but, there's a, but there is a direct correlation. For example, here in chapter 6 of the uh, book of Moses. The Lord's telling Moses, or rather, the Lord's telling Adam, rather, to teach these things freely to his children, the doctrines of the new birth. And as a basis for the doctrines of the new birth, he says, You teach them that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death. Now, note, death didn't come by transgression. Death came by the fall. But transgression brought the fall and the fall brought death. That by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death. You see that? Now let me reason with you this way. When Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, not only did he disobey the commandment of God, so that there was a spiritual death imposed. The violation of law then brings uh, the judgments of God in the sense of the withdrawal of the Spirit. And so he died spiritually. But he also, in partaking of the forbidden fruit some way that we know not fully about, he also then introduced within this world the elements of deterioration, so that elements of deterioration begin to work and to operate within the physical body and spread from there then into the world. And as a result then of, of transgression came the fall. And the fall then opened the door for those elements to operate. Now, if there had been no fall spiritually, then it would be like a person who is mortal <coughs> and who is endowed with enough of the spirit to be a translated being. He's still mortal, but he's got the powers of glory and spirit within him, and they're powers of life, and they check and counter man, counter effect the forces of deterioration within him and sustain him so that death has no hold upon him. You see that? Now, Adam and his posterity, if they were still in the presence of God, if there had been no spiritual fall, even though they partook of elements that were deteriorating their effects upon them, they still wouldn't die because the powers of the Spirit, as dominant powers, would supersede the influence of those corrupting forces and they would sustain them in their life, you see. And so it took the spiritual fall to bring the physical fall, see. It took that. And then Adam uh, 
was driven out and the cherubim was placed to guard the tree of life, because if they had have gone back in their fallen spiritual state, they had gone back in the garden and partaken of the tree of life, it would have nullified the effects of the fall physically from them, and they would have lived forever in their sins. They would have, have lived forever physically in a fallen spiritual state. Can you see the two situations? One situation is that, that they, they wouldn't have died. They, they'd, have, they'd have had elements of corruption, but that, they, that the spiritual fall would have countermanded that. The other situation is that having fallen and died a uh, spiritual death and uh, driven from the garden, if they had been permitted to come back, they would have nullified the effects of the fall. And so Alma makes a beautiful explanation of and uh, speaks of it. You might want to read all that in more detail. Now, on that basis then, <clears throat> verse 6, And as he spake forth the word of God, the people trembled and could not stand in his presence. And the reason for that is that he had such a clarity of truth with its power, and then his language was so comprehensive in its expression that you could bring a lot of truth to bear at the same time on people, and they literally buckled in the knees by the power of truth. And he said unto them, Because that Adam fell, we are. Now, where is there another statement like that? Adam fell, that men might be. You see that? And it's the same idea. Because Adam fell, we are. And by his fall came death. And we are made partakers of misery and woe. Behold, Satan hath come among the children of men, and tempted them to worship him. And here's again that second stage of the fall. And men have become carnal, sensual, and devilish, and are shut out from the presence of God. You see that? That's the second stage of the fall. And, uh, but he says, But God hath made known unto our fathers that all men must repent. And we'll pick that one up when we talk about uh, the subject of, of rebirth in another time. <clears throat> now, what's the nature of fallen man? Have you ever had an argument where the, the, when the question was asked, is man basically good or is he basically evil? Have you ever had that kind of an argument in the gospel doctrine class? And the inevitable result is you generate more fire, more heat than fire, and more heat than light. And you get people who are quoting things on both sides of the story, and uh, the end result then is intense conflict and no one gets converted. They just have a heated time. Now, the reason for that is because the question is nonsensical. Now, what's a nonsense uh, question? Well, it's one that's not geared to, a right, to, to, to elicit or bring forth a right answer. And so this is a nonsense question. Now, why is it a nonsense question? Well, because it just talks about man, per se, where in order to get to the issue, you've got to talk about man as a dual being. You've got to ask, for example, what's the nature of man's spirit under the fall? You've got to ask the question, what's the nature and state of man's physical body under the fall? Then you've got to ask further, what's the influence of the Spirit of the Lord on individuals in the fall? And then you've got to ask, what's the spirit of the adversary? And where does it fit? And how does that all add up to an understanding of whether man, of about man and his nature and mortality, see? Then you've got the basis to get some intelligence on it. Otherwise, you've asked a nonsense question, and the only thing you get is heat and contention. Now, looking at it then in the right way, <clears throat> What's the nature of man's spirit in the fall? Well, all of us who came here got through the war in heaven, didn't we? And so we passed a minimal hurdle. Many of them just got way over it, like Abraham and others, see. But everyone had to have make a minimal effort and get over it, so that basically the spirit then is disposed to do good. Here in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord talks about <clears throat> things a little, he says, uh, every, verse 38, every spirit of man was innocent in the beginning, 
and God having redeemed man from the fall, men became again, now they're talking about a second time, again in their infant state innocent before God. Now I don't know what beginning means, it's somewhere probably back at spirit birth. But then the next phase of that explanation applies to the infant, the spirit of an infant when he comes to mortality. God having redeemed man from the fall, because of the redemption of Christ, then man, men become in, again in their infant state, innocent before God. See, in the Christian world you have what we call original sin. Now, there was an original transgression. There was an original transgression. We've said a few things about it. But the fallacy of the Christian world is, <clears throat> in their doctrine of original sin, that the power of the atonement doesn't have anything to do with the consequences until you embrace God and then the determinists get in there and say that God has to do it himself. And that there are some who are who are predetermined to do good, and there's some who are determined to be reprobate. It's like an old fellow that I tried to convert to the gospel down in Tennessee years and years ago. He had uh, university and college uh, certificates plastered all over one wall, and he'd been, he'd been through the educational mill. And uh, he said to me, he said, now I'm held around just. Let me tell you about this thing called predestination. He says it's simply this. You can and you must. You will or you won't. You'll be damned if you do and you'll be damned if you don't. <laughs> now, that's the idea. You see that? That's the, that's the basic idea. Now, what I'm saying is that the Spirit was innocent in the beginning and then through the atonement, through the atonement, then you become innocent. Children are alive in Christ. I don't care how they get here. There's no such thing as an illegitimate child. There are illegitimate parents. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. There are illegitimate parents. But every child is blessed with the grace of God and the power of the atonement. And they are innocent before God, regardless of how they get here. You see that? And in that sense, then, the Spirit, the Spirit, then, stands free. And yet, at the same time, the Spirit is under the fall, because it's voluntarily submitted, then, to come to earth in the fallen state. And in the Council of Heaven, the whole issue was discussed there and explained, and finally a vote was called for. All of you who sustain Adam, or will sustain him and institute in the fall, so that you become recipients of all of its effects and consequences, get your hand in the air. And you had your hand in the air, all of you. So when you get out of bed on the wrong side in the morning, and it just seems like the whole world is falling apart and the devil is broken loose in every way and form and shape, just keep in mind you voted for it. Just keep in mind you voted for it, see? Just make that a basic thing, see? All right, so you're under the power of the fall. And the spirit then has different cap uh, different qualities. I mean, according to the individual achievements in pre-earth life, some come here as as gods, having been gods in pre-earth life, and they become gods on this earth, as Enoch did, as Moses did, as Abraham was, as Joseph the prophet said he was, and the people in Nauvoo didn't like it and took him out and plotted with the mob to get him killed. That's one reason why they martyred him. But he taught the plurality of gods and also taught that he was the god of this dispensation, see. Well, there were some then who come under those circumstances, see, and uh, it depends. But, but while there's that gradation, there's still that basic innocence. Now, what's the condition of the flesh? Well, first of all, the flesh is good. Where did you get the endowments of the flesh? Where do you get the drives in the flesh? You get them from... From your parents, and you go back through and you get them from God. He implants them in us, including the drive for, uh, for the union of the sexes and the attraction there, because he creates man and woman as one unit to start with, and they're supposed to be one unit. And a man who is a real man makes his wife feel more womanly, and a woman who is a real woman makes her husband feel more manly. And without that relationship, 
Without that relationship, that male-female relationship, you're simply not what you ought to be. There's a deficiency there, a critical deficiency there, because you're designed then to be one flesh. It takes two to make one, and that one is not you and it's not you. It's two of you combined. You see that? Now, in that sense then, uh, the flesh is good, but what's happened to the flesh? What happened to the flesh in the fall? Well, they was introduced into it, the elements of corruption, the deterioration. And those elements of corruption and deterioration work on the flesh. And as I said earlier, the flesh then becomes a barrier to you until you have the humility to get the Spirit of the Lord. And it still remains a barrier until you finally break through enough so that you get the Spirit of the Lord in your life and you're a man of God or a woman of God. Then you become a whole person, see? And then the physical organism begins to be an instrument of power to you. See, power derives from organization. That's just a basic principle. Power derives from organization. And uh, you've got that organization there, and it's under the command of your will. It's contaminated. It's a corrupt body. But if you utilize the powers of the atonement and get the forgiveness of sins and the sanctification of the Spirit, then the benefits of that organization, the power benefits of that organization, begin to operate. And you begin to have a silent power that just is associated with you. And as you go on and get priesthood power in your life, then you feel that mantle and that endowment. As you have, I've seen it more than one time, as you see a prophet walk into the room, you can just feel the power that's there, see? There's an endowment. He's a man. He's a real man spiritually, as well as physically. See, he may be broken and aged spirit physically, but the power and the endowment is there. You see that? And that's a part of the ball game. Now, the, the flesh then is, is there, and it's a challenge. Now, the question is, how does the Spirit operate? And here is an important point. The Prophet Joseph Smith talks about this here in the Teachings, page 355. And he says this, and this is a, a, a classic statement. He says, All things whatsoever uh, God in his infinite wisdom has seen fit and proper to reveal to us while we are dwell in mortality in regards to our mortal bodies, are revealed to us in the abstract and independent of affinity of this mortal tabernacle, but are revealed to our spirits precisely as though we had no bodies, as though we had no bodies at all. And those revelations which will save our spirits will save our bodies. Now, the Lord looks at you as though you are in eternity. And when he reveals things to you, it's a revelation from his Holy Spirit to you and your Holy Spirit. Your spirit. Maybe unholy, but it's your spirit. Okay. He, he reveals it to you directly as though you had no physical body. And then if you act on that, its influence then is first upon the, the spirit organism. And from there then it extends into the physical. And so you sanctify the physical from the, from the inward to the outward sphere, from the spirit to the flesh. And you do that then by the personal discipline of your soul, where you pray till you sweat at times. And I've had to do that, and I hope you've had to do that. If you haven't had to do that, you're not mortal. You pray till you sweat. For the Lord to give you that kind of consistency where you can live in tune with his spirit and keep it consistently. And you plead and you work and you stand and you covenant with the Lord, I'm going to do it. Now, please give me the strength and the power to walk with you, see. And as you do that then, and as you do it with a resolve, and particularly as you bring the principle of covenant in there in a proper way, and act on that intelligently and conscientiously, then the Lord honors covenant, and he extends the power of the Spirit to you, uh, suspends the demands of justice through his mercy, cleanses and refines and expands your spirit, and extends that influence into your flesh. 
so that as it says in section uh, 84, you're sanctified by the Spirit under the renewing of your body. You see that? And that's the program. All right, now what's the program on the other hand in relation then to the adversary? Well, the adversary operates in the exact opposite way. The adversary operates on that element that's congenial to himself, that's part of your nature. And in the fall, what is that element? That element is the corruption within your system. And so he acts then on the corruption in the flesh. And if he can get you through enticement and through pride and through vanity and through lust, if he can get you to follow those improper promptings, then not only does he contaminate the flesh, but he contaminates the organized spirit, does he not? And he works in a reverse way. I'll read, for example, and won't have time to get really to it. We've run out of time again. Here in Second Nephi chapter 2, the great classic statement, if Luther had had this one and understood it, we'd have had a different Reformation entirely. If Calvin had had this, <coughs> we'd have had a different Reformation entirely. He talks, for example, <coughs> about Christ and his coming. He says here in verse 26, The Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they were redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever. That they become free forever, knowing <coughs> good from evil, to act for themselves. And not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law of the great in the last day. See, the atonement steps in, not only sustains life, <coughs> but it gives agency and it breaks down the barrier so that you are free to act. It operates so that you are free to act in this fallen state. <coughs> he says, wherefore men are free according to the flesh. And all things are given to them which are expedient to man, and they are free to choose liberty. Now, freedom and liberty are two different things. You're free to choose liberty and eternal life. Freedom is just the basic, fundamental, beginning act and right of choice. Liberty is an achievement. Liberty is associated with the atonement. Liberty is associated with the eternal life and the powers of the Spirit. The essence of liberty is spirit. And that spirit then expresses itself outwardly in a free theology, in a free ideology. And on the basis of that inward spirit and that then ideology and theology of freedom, <clears throat> then you set up the forms of liberty the forms of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, see? Now, our big problem in America is that the essence of liberty is gone, and even the, the ideology of liberty is gone. And we're trying to operate merely on the forms of liberty, and those forms we are translating, instead of into liberty, we are translating them into license. And that's where we are. You see that? We're in the final stages of the disintegration of a God-given system, and the end result is violence. Hyped up life. You've got to have a new action every second, and it's got to be sensual, and it's got to be worldly, and it's got to be highly stimulating. It's got to be the, the heavy beat of the drum, and it's got to be the fast-moving pace, and it's got to be geared then toward ego and toward power and toward lust. Now, we're in that kind of a situation, see. But you choose liberty and eternal life through the mediation of, of men, and that's through Christ. Or you choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. And now, my sons, Lehi says, I would that you should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments and be faithful unto his words, and choose liberty, eternal life, according to the will of the Holy Spirit. You see, that is a spiritual thing. And not choose eternal death, according to the flesh, and note this, and the evil which is therein. Now, where is the evil? And then note the next step, 
which giveth the spirit of the devil power to captivate, that he may bring you down to hell, that he may reign over you in his own kingdom. Now, can you see the picture there? And see the challenge of our mortality. And see then that the solution is to turn to Christ, and not enough just to turn to him, but you've got to be changed and transformed. You've got to be born again. You've got to put off the natural man. You've got to become a new creature in Christ. And it's only then that liberty becomes a meaningful thing to you, and it's only then that personal dignity becomes a meaningful thing to you. And it's only then that you begin to have the joy of your redemption. Now, may the Lord bless us, my brothers and sisters. I appreciate this opportunity. There's much that can be said further about the doctrine of the fall. But it's important. If you don't understand the fall, you don't understand why you need to have Christ. <clears throat> and the doctrine of Christ begins with the fall. May the Lord bless us to understand that, apply it. We'll see you this evening. What time? Seven o'clock? I want to talk about the atonement tonight. And uh, we'll take up the picture then at that point. Thank you very much.